Okay, welcome back, and this is our um, last set of lectures. This is our Unit 11 lectures, which is our final unit. And uh, originally I was hoping to have uh, kind of a full set of lectures for Unit 11, but uh, we're only going to have um, some art historical lecture, uh, lectures for this unit, and we're basically just going to cover the topic of contemporary art. And so a lot of the art that you're going to see, you'll be, you might notice, is art you've already seen because I've tried very hard throughout all the lectures in the course on every topic wherever I could to include some contemporary art examples. Um, but this first lecture is actually going to start where we left off, which was with modernism. And we're going to kind of tell somewhat of a complicated story about like how we got from there to here. And this story um, begins with one of the the issues in modernism, which is that with the, the focus on essentialism, there can be this sense that we've, we're aiming for somewhere, we're aiming for somewhere, and then the sense of like, well, we got there, so what do we do now? Um, and so what we're going to be talking about is a little bit of a story of kind of like some consecutive senses of crisis in the modernist movement as a whole. And um, so when we last left off, modernism although definitely not every artist was pursuing these forms of, of absolute reductive approaches to abstraction. Um, and actually, we have, I'm going to take my time on this. Before we get any further, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between the word abstraction and um, non-objective, because a lot of students get confused about this, so I want to be um, as absolutely clear as possible, um, which is that there's a difference between abstraction, like let's say this Mondrian piece, versus non-objective, like this Malevich piece. They may look very similar to each other, but they are fundamentally different in that abstraction means, right, when we say abstract art, what we usually mean is we mean artwork that we don't quite understand what it's about. But that's not what abstract art means. It means that it has been abstracted. Um, as you might remember from our lecture on high modernism, these Mondrian pieces come primarily out of this study of trees. And so he's thinking about verticals and horizontals as a way of organizing picture plane, but he's th thinking about them as coming from his observation about trees and about negative space shapes as being the colors and then the space between. Whereas Malevich's suprematist pieces are more abstract in that they are based on an abstract concept and that makes them non-objective rather than abstract, right? If that makes sense, that they are, they're not an abstraction of anything. They are simply a painting of a black square and a red square. Um, and we'll come back to this ag again and again, uh, maybe on, in this lecture, about the difference between abstraction and um, non-objective artwork. But, um, you know, and another way to say that is non-representational. Abstraction essentially is a form of representation, right? Because there was some representation, some idea that it started with. Okay, so um, as I was saying, modernism was getting to a point where to many of the modernist painters, they were starting to wonder, where do we go from here? And this probably was a moment where um, by the time we got to the 20s, to the late 20s, where artists were um, starting to embrace directions that were more involving representation and figurative work, and that probably could have been where things um, went. But we hit World War II, and that sort of shifted a number of things and actually gave, in some ways, gave kind of pure formalist modernism um, kind of second legs to go in a new direction. What happened was that a number of art movements were basically abruptly ended. The Bauhaus was disbanded. Um, all kinds of art movements were kind of upended because of the war and because of because of um, the the political events that were going on, and a number of artists were. Uh, forced to leave Europe. A number of them settled in North America, and um, so uh, including Joseph Albers and Hans Hoffmann right here. And many of these people then also became teachers who taught art in the United States. In fact, actually, not only um, 
those two, but also Piet Mondrian and, and Pablo Picasso, all settled in uh, the New York City area uh, temporarily. People like um, uh, Max Beckman also came to the U.S. And so there's all these European artists, all these modernists, uh, coming to the U.S. and bringing that culture with them. And many of these people then also became teachers of uh, new artists. And so we have a new kind of development in American art. And so after the war, here's some more Hans Hoffman paintings. After the war, um, American art kind of takes a new direction, tries to pursue um, abstraction and also non-objective art with more intensity. And, um, and I mean, this is not every American arts, but all of a sudden, these trends in American art become much more important. And, um, and then the position of American art in the world becomes much more important. All of a sudden, uh, people in Europe and around the world are looking at American art and, and thinking, well, this actually is kind of an interesting direction that these people are going in. And this is the beginning of abstract expressionism. So abstract expressionism in some ways delays what many saw as kind of the inevitable end of, of modernism, this crisis that people were anticipating. Um, it delays it and extends it. And um, it's kind of a complicated story of how these painters are also allied with a set of um, art critics and writers, um, most notably Clement Greenberg, who kind of propose a new sort of like this a, a version of modernism that is very much focused on pure formalism, on the idea that the mark on the, let's say for painting, that paint on the surface is the fundamental thing that painting is about. And and that leads to um, some of the, the more famous examples of abstract expressionism, like uh, Jackson Pollock. This is um, uh, Autumn Field. And, and kind of classic abstract expressionist statements like this Franz Klein and Robert Motherwell and Mark Rothko. We've seen um, one of these before, the orange and yellow. We've seen multiple times in this course. Um, We've seen both of these before, and this is all part of this um, new direction. And so, to a certain degree, up, right up to like 1960, right up to the end of the 50s, the the energy of abstract expressionism kind of carries this kind of idea of modernist formalism further. And one of the main things that they add to it is this idea of the mark and of gesture. Um, often, when when this school of painting first began, they actually generally didn't call themselves, and other people didn't call them abstract expressionists, they called them action painters. And it's a very literal, but it's also a very subtle philosophical way of describing it, because it, the point is, that they're trying to get at, is that all painting is simply a thing you make that is a record record of the actions that you used to make it. It's a record of your gesture, of your hand, of your mark making system, and and then that that school of action painting becomes heavily influential on a lot of artists, uh, such as Richard Diebenkorn. Uh, and we've seen a number of Diebenkorn paintings, um, and so Diebenkorn is known generally as being part of the Bay Area figurative school, but a lot of these people were heavily influenced by the abstract expressionist painters, even though that is my one minute mark. So um, we're just about to end, and another artist who's kind of like in this post-abstract period would be an artist like Joan Mitchell. We've seen a couple of her paintings throughout the course. Um, and in this next slide, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what was also going on in Europe at the same time. All right, that's where we're going to end for now. Thanks.